So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Vasa Beno uh, from uh, APC Paris uh, uh, and uh, like uh, he's uh, like researcher in the uh, he mostly re do research in the primordial cosmology and uh, in the overlapping branch of quantum mechanics and uh, he did his PhD with Professor Jerome Martin uh, from IAP Paris. Then he was a postdoc at ICG Portsmouth. He had written an excellent number of good papers and his work particularly, uh, uh, you can able to see, he mostly talk about uh, the primordial aspects today and uh, what are the relations uh, to this primordial perturbations to quantum mechanics. So uh, Vasa, it's a really, uh, uh, so you are the 30th speaker of QASTM seminar series and he's a very good friend of mine. So, and he's also a very good speaker, I know. Mm -hmm. And it's thank I'm very thankful that uh, you agreed to give the talk and, uh, uh, yeah, you can start, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sanyatan, and uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to this uh, quantum aspects of space, time, and matter uh, forum. I think it's a very nice uh, setup that you have uh, here, especially at the moment when people cannot travel much. Um, to be able to gather online and discuss physics is, I think, a very comforting and useful uh, thing to do. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I know that this is um, um, intended to be a pedagogical and um, an interactive uh, format of a presentation. So what I've done is to prepare something where I can easily stop at various uh, stages. Um, so please do not hesitate to interrupt me and ask questions at any time you want, because it does not really matter, even if we take some time to discuss questions. Um, yeah, it's okay. so yeah, one request to all the listeners that please don't write anything in the chat box. Just ask the speaker. He will be always available to give the answer. Yeah, yeah. Also, I because I'm sharing my screen, I've hidden the window where I have the, um, I mean, the, the other participants because I'm afraid that you see this on top of my of my slides, so I won't be able to see, I don't think I will be able to see if you type something in the chat. So please just turn on, on your microphone and, and, and speak if you want to interrupt me. Uh, I'm happy to discuss at any time. Um, okay, so the topic of my presentation, because this is a forum on quantum aspects of space, time and matter, is a combination of primordial cosmology, which is my field of, of research, but I will try to describe this field by putting some highlights into uh, quantum aspects, namely what we know of the quantum nature of the uh, physical processes that took place in the early universe and how much we can learn about it, how much we can test about it. Um, so what I will do is to start by a brief uh, recap of the standard model of um, early cosmology, uh, insisting on this uh, hypothesis that we call cosmic inflation. And then I will move on to explain how cosmological perturbations are produced in this scenario and what questions does it uh, raise regarding the quantum nature of these, of these perturbations and, uh, and what we can test about them. So inflation is a phase of uh, accelerated expansion that took place in the very early universe at high energy. Accelerated expansion means that um, the scale factor A which appears here in the, in, in the metric, which describes the homogeneous and isotropic universe, is not only increasing, so A dot is positive, or A dot is a derivation with respect to cosmic time, but A double dot is also positive, which means that the, the rate at which, um, I mean, the speed at which the universe expands is, is itself increasing. So it is something that was proposed to take place um, in the very early universe at the beginning of the 80s by a number of people before you can see a list on the, on the left of the screen. And the reason for proposing such a phase is because at that time there were some issues with the hot Big Bang model. Um, for instance, the, the horizon problem, which is the fact that if you believe in the hot Big Bang model and do not assume any phase of inflation, then what you find is that uh, two points, um, two different, I mean, if you look at the sky, 
Um, and if you take uh, uh, points in different directions, they should be causally disconnected, which means that since the birth of the universe, there is no time for a photon or for anything else with, to travel between these two points. And as a consequence, they should look uh, very different because there is no physical mechanism that could communicate information or uh, share something between, between these two points. However, when you observe the universe on very large distances, what you quickly realize is that it is very, it, it looks very much the same in different regions. So it is homogeneous on scales much larger than what would be the horizon scale without inflation. And, and if you, so that, that is called the horizon problem. And if you introduce such a phase of inflation, then you bring all the observable universe within the same uh, causal patch and you solve that, that, that problem. So, Marcel, yeah. I had one question. Sure, sure. So, like, uh, uh, during inflation, we have some, uh, this accelerated expansion. That's right. So here, yeah. the uh, scale factor grows exponential. Okay. Yeah. Uh, approximately exponential. Yeah. So what is the difference between this expansion with the late time scale, like, present day? Like yeah, so... So there, is no di so there is no difference in the sense that in both cases we have accelerated expansion. So we have a double dot uh, positive in both cases. Yeah. And in fact, uh, there are even some uh, proposals that the same um, physical mechanism responsible for inflation might be also responsible for the recent accelerated expansion. So it could be that um, in both cases, uh, a slowly rolling scale field uh, would drive uh, this phase of accelerated expansion. However, the, the, the main difference between those two phases in the universe is that they take place at very different energy densities. So inflation is a very high energy phenomenon, dark true. energy is a very, yeah. That's true, because I, here I'm a little bit worried, because inflation happened in very high energy scale, that's so right. If you use some scalar field models from particle physics or string theory, whatever, those are very high scale theories. Yeah. Now, if you want to explain dark energy or accelerated expansion with the same model, you have to justify that throughout the evolution that uh, will survive. But yeah, it yeah. always happen. How much it is physically justifiable that that yeah, high yeah. scale theory will flow to that? Uh, low scale. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. So that's one of the main challenges of these uh, proposals, which is that you have to control, you have, a, I mean, you have to, you need to have control on a theory over uh, many, many orders of magnitude. And usually this is not something easy to do because when you run the energy scale, you, you have to, uh, well, you have to run everything. You have to compute uh, loop corrections to, uh, um, to a very, um, uh, 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 to very high accuracy and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean I'm, I'm not saying that this is this is certainly one possibility to explain the, uh, the recent acceleration but it's not maybe not the main one or not the only one and um, yeah I was just I was just saying that just to point out that the, the, two, the two phases are similar in the sense that they undergo an accelerated expansion but otherwise they are indeed very different because they take place at different energies. The, maybe the most natural expectation is that they are driven by different physical um, phenomena, which, sure. um, which sure. I think would be, yeah. Um, okay, so as you, as you said, inflation is a very high energy phenomenon. So we do not know exactly at which, uh, so what was the energy density of the universe when inflation took place? What we know, however, is some bounds. So we know that the energy density rho has to be larger than 10 MeV. And this is just because at 10 MeV, Big Bang nucleosynthesis takes place and inflation needs to be before Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So, and we also know, at least in the simplest models, that um, the energy has to be smaller than 10 to the 16 GeV. And the reason is, if the energy is larger than 10 to the 16 GeV, in the simplest models, at least, you produce too much gravitational waves. So we, you would produce a, a primordial amount of gravitational waves that would be observed by, by Planck, for instance, which is not the case. So this puts an upper bound. So you see that between these two bounds, there are many, many orders of magnitude. So we don't know. Uh, there is a large uncertainty on the energy density. But in any case, it is always a high, very high value. So it's a very high energy uh, phenomenon by particle physics standard. 
And um, what it also means is that by studying inflation and by studying the uh, observables associated with inflation, one can probe physics at a scale that you cannot probe in accelerators, in particle physics accelerators. So this is one of the reasons why inflation is an interesting uh, is an interesting. Oh, okay, I have one more question. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, like, so like, there is another possibility which is called bouncing cosmology. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So how one can differentiate? Uh, like, is there is any differentiability from the perspective of observation, or what? What exactly different there? Because that is also one of the possibilities. Yes, yes, indeed. So another uh, way to solve the, the horizon problem, for instance, yeah. is indeed to assume that, inflate, that the universe went through a contracting phase, mm -hmm. low contracting phase, and then there was a, a bounce. So something that we do not really understand, but which could, be, which, could, which could arise, for instance, from the quantum nature of gravity, that there is a sort of a minimum size for the universe um, exactly as in quantum physics, you have some, uh, um, I mean, some quantities cannot take an exactly zero value, right? You have, uh, yeah. because of the uncertainty principle. So you could imagine that as the universe shrinks um, and the energy density increases, you reach the, you reach the realm of uh, quantum gravity, which prevents the universe from shrinking more, and then there is a bounce. And then, so, so you have a contracting phase and you have an expanding phase. And in such a scenario, you also explain, for instance, a horizon problem. Um, however, so of course, um, I mean, one of the main issues within these models is what happens at the bounce, right? Because yeah. if you really want to describe the bounce fully, in principle, you would need a quantum theory of gravity, which we do not have. So you need to make some assumptions. And depending on these assumptions, you typically get different uh, predictions uh, okay. for the model. So some of these predictions can be made the same as inflation. Some of them are sometimes different. It's not, it's not so clear. Um, but but there are some but there are some uh, different uh, uh, things. For instance, it, there there is a class of uh, bouncing cosmologies which are called the equipyrotic scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and in these models, the amplitude of gravitational waves is always very small. Oh, uh, is always yeah. tiny. So if, uh, if for instance, um, the next generation of CMB experiments like Lightbird detected, uh, detected some gravitational waves from the early universe, that would immediately rule out the pyrotic scenario, this class of bouncing objects. Um, oh. But the problem is so. But the problem is, if they do not detect it, then you do, you cannot say anything, right? Because it could be that there is a bouncing. Uh, it could be that the universe bounced, and and that would be the explanation for a small amount of gravitational. No, I, I I was pretty worried about this degeneracy. Like both of them predict sometimes same. So in that case, how to break that? So yeah. like if gravitational waves is detected, then you can say something actually. That's right. Yeah. If they are detected, then I think then that would be uh, some further indication um, in the favor of inflation, indeed, yeah. um, in that sense. But of course, it's not a proof, right? Because you can also have gravitation waves in other scenarios. Sure, sure. Yeah, you, you can, yeah. Um, yeah, so let me, yeah, where am I? Yeah, at the end of this slide. Um, so, of course, one of the things that you can quickly realize if you want to have a phase of inflation is that you need a fluid with negative pressure. And the reason is if you write down the Einstein equations for a homogeneous and isotropic universe filled with a perfect fluid with energy density rho and pressure P, then you find this relationship that A double dot over A is proportional to minus uh, rho plus three P. So if the energy density is positive, rho is positive, and if you want um, A double dot to be positive for inflation to take place, then you need this rho plus 3p to be negative, so you need a negative p. So what it means is that, um, well, you, you cannot make inflation with uh, fluid, a regular fluid as you, as you know it at low energies. On the other hand, because inflation takes place at very high energy, you do not expect matter to be described in terms of uh, low energy fluids anyway. You expect it to be described in terms of fields, which is the way that we describe matter at high energy. And as it turns out, if you consider the simplest field that uh, you can think of, uh, so if you take a scalar field phi, 
if you take it to be homogeneous, so it does not depend on it does not depend on space, it only depends on time, then what you find is that this condition of um, rho plus 3p negative is realized as soon as the potential energy of the field, so if this field has some potential field, uh, V of phi, if the potential energy of the field is larger than two times its kinetic energy. So what it means in practice is if you take some high energy completion of the standard model, and if you find um, in this extension, if you find a scalar field with a potential V of phi which is sufficiently flat, so the field slowly rolls down this potential and the kinetic energy of the field is smaller than uh, half of its potential energy, then you have found a good candidate for inflation. And this is a game that many people play, trying to find um, setups in which such fields appear. It, it's not an easy game because most of the time quantum corrections or high energy corrections, they will um, um, spoil the flatness of the potential. So it's not it's not an easy task to find a setup in which the potential is flat enough for this condition to be fulfilled but it is something that can be realized assuming some symmetries and uh, and, and playing a bit um, so this is the way that uh, so this is the simplest way to realize inflation with a scalar field phi and and as i said before it, it solves um, some of the hot big bang models uh, problems such as the horizon problem but what really made inflation popular, and, and, and I think an interesting uh, uh, idea, is that it comes with a number of predictions. And the reason is that, um, in fact, it can also, not only can it explain the, uh, the, the shape of the universe, of the homogeneous, of the background universe, on the larger scales, but it can also explain the structures that we see in the universe, the small fluctuations, the small perturbations. And the reason is the following. So if you consider an a homogeneous and expanding universe, there is, on, there is a single function of time which characterizes that universe, the geometry, which is the scale factor A, A as a function of time. So from that quantity, you can build um, um, an expansion parameter, which is called the Hubble parameter, A dot over A. And so H minus, I mean, the inverse of H has a dimension of a time scale, or if you set C equals one, it has a dimension of the length scale. So this guy gives you a physical uh, dimension full quantity, which characterizes the expansion. So it characterizes the curvature of space-time, if you wish. Now, if you put some scalar field, or if you put some field or some whatever um, uh, uh, quantity on that background, and if you Fourier expand this uh, field, what you you find that the behavior of each Fourier mode will very much depend on how the wavelength associated to your mode, to your wave, compares to this typical length scale. So if the wavelength is much smaller than the Hubble radius, H minus one is called the Hubble radius, then it means that um, locally um, within one oscillation of your wave, you do not really see the curvature of space-time. So it is the same as if you perform experiments uh, on Earth uh, in the lab, so at the level of, I don't know, scales of one meter, two meters, then you do not need to take into account that the, the Earth is a curved surface, right? Because one meter or two meters is, very, is much smaller than the radius of the Earth, and so you can neglect the effect of the curvature of the Earth's surface. However, if you now consider a wavelength which is much larger, then you do need to take this into account. So if you want to measure the distance between, I don't know, uh, Munich and, uh, and New York, then you do need to take into account that you're measuring distances over a, over a curved surface. So whether or not the curvature of your background matters uh, depends on whether or not the wavelength is smaller or larger than this quantity H minus one. And what happens during inflation is that um, there is a transition. So Obviously, these two quantities, lambda and h minus one, depend on time. h minus one depends on time a priori because a is a function of time, so h is a function of time, although during inflation it's almost a constant, this h factor. But lambda increases because lambda, because of the expansion of, of space time, right? So lambda grows as a scale factor a. And so in practice, during inflation, you have a transition between this regime on the left hand side, where lambda is smaller than the Hubble radius, and you do not feel the, the curvature of space-time. And this regime on the right-hand side, where you do feel curvature of space-time. And this regime on the right-hand side is very important because if this field or this wave that you're considering is quantum, then you have a quantum field on top of a curved background. 
And in quantum field theory, whenever you have a quantum field on top of a curved background, you have something which is called particle production. Okay, it's spontane spontaneous particle production, which is a quantum mechanism. And this particle production mechanism will um, give rise to the production of uh, cosmological perturbations. Okay, so I will explain in details um, how it works, but this is just a cartoon to, to set up the, uh, the main ideas. So, Ross, I have a question. Yeah, sure. If it is exactly constant, then you can't able to stop inflation. That's correct. So yeah. You need a little bit of deviation from that. That's right. Which we call slow roll. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. True. Yeah, that's correct. So H minus, so H is approximately constant, um, but it is not exactly constant. Um, so you see, if because H is A dot over A, if H is exactly constant, then it means that A goes like, if you solve this as a differential equation for A, you get A is exponential H times T, um, which means that A grows exponentially with time and you never stop inflation. So you need to have some deviation and you need H to slightly decrease with time and at some point this, this will stop inflation. Um, so this is, this, is, this is another cartoon to, to, to explain what is going on. So here you have the uh, time evolution of the Hubble radius, this uh, magenta line as a function of time. Time is labeled by a quantity which we call the number of e-folds, n, which is the logarithm of uh, the scale factor a. So as the universe expands, a increases, so n increases. So time goes from the left to the right on this plot. And you see the value of the Hubble radius is a function of time in different uh, eras. During inflation, as, as we just said, it is almost constant, but you see it increases very, very slightly. And at some point, inflation stops. You have a radiation era a matter-dominated era, and more recently, something which is um, dominated by some form of dark energy. And on the other hand, I've displayed the wavelength of uh, a given Fourier mode, which uh, just increases with A, just proportional to A, in such a way that, as you can see, at early time, lambda um, is smaller than the Hubble radius, which means that the physics is the same as in flat space-time. And this is something which is very important for us because it means that you can set your initial conditions in the past at a point when you do not feel the curvature of space-time. And this is very useful if you want to start out your initial conditions in the vacuum state, right? Because if you are in a flat space-time, if you're in a Minkowski geometry, then it is easy to, to define a vacuum state. It is just a vacuum state of regular uh, quantum theory. Um, and then, as the expansion feeds that is larger than one over h, the Hubble radius, so you start to feel the expansion, you start to feel the curvature, and this uh, gives rise to come to this quantum particle production on large scales, on the scales larger than the Hubble radius. Um, so after inflation, um, as I said, the universe has this phase of radiation domination and matter domination, and at some point, because the universe expands, it, it dilutes itself, and there is a, a point at which the universe becomes transparent, which means that photons travel, um, they will typically be absorbed or scattered by um, a charged particles. But at some point, these charged particles, they become sufficiently uh, diluted so that the photons travel freely. And this is what we call the last scattering surface, because this is the point at which the photons uh, undergo their last scatterings. And this last scattering surface is, is, is the cosmic microwave background that we observe. Because this is the, the, the most, um, I mean, because this is the, the, yeah, the most past point of the universe we can see, this is the picture that we have, which is the closest to inflation. So it is one of the best probes we have uh, to constrain inflation. So here is just a map of the uh, temperature anisotropies measured on this cosmic microwave background. So the temperature of the photons is, is, is almost the same at every point. Um, it is very, very homogeneous. But if you subtract the mean value, and if you only look at the small fluctuations, you get this map where you can see you have fluctuations at the level of the micro uh, Kelvin degree. So it's, it's, it's very small fluctuations. It's at, at the order of 10 to the minus 5 compared to the background value. And uh, so this is just a map of the temperature and different points in, in, in on the sky surface uh, as measured by the Planck satellite. So this is just, this is the same map, but I've just uh, shown a comparison between the data uh, obtained by Planck and the data obtained by two previous satellites, COBE in 1992 
and WMAP in 2003, just to show you how well the accuracy of the data has improved. COBE was the first satellite to actually observe the uh, anisotropy, so the deviations from just the background value of the temperature, but you see that uh, the, definite, the resolution of the, of, the, of, of the data was not excellent. And WMAP made a big step forward um, in terms of precision and Planck really remade it. Um, so, uh, so it is, so it is uh, something very, I mean, which contains lots of information to constrain inflation in the Earth universe. So how do we understand these maps and how do we interpret and extract information from these maps? So what we do is the following. If you assume that inflation is driven by a single scalar field, which I said before is the simplest scenario you can think of, then one can show that there is a single um, a scalar degree of freedom, uh, which is gauge invariant. So gauge invariant here means that, um, of course, in GR, uh, because you can, um, because there is no given choice of coordinates to describe the system, you can choose different coordinates. Then there is some freedom in the way that you parameterize your fluctuations. And uh, some of this freedom is just, a, is just, just corresponds to choice of gauge, so, so to a choice of uh, slicing. So you have your space time, you have time and space, and you can slice um, your space time into different uh, space-like hypersurfaces. And so if you measure things like the energy um, on a certain hypersurface, it's not the same as if you measure it on a different hypersurface. So some of the different uh, results you, you, you get are just related to this choice of parameterization. And once you absorb this, uh, uh, these degrees of freedom, the one containing the choice of parameterization, then what you find is that there is a single scalar degree of freedom, which here I call V, and which is in fact a combination of fluctuations in the scalar field phi, the one that drives inflation, and the components of the metric uh, G mu nu. Um, so there is this combination, which is, by the way, on large scales, directly proportional to the temperature fluctuation, the one that you observe on the cosmic microwave background, the CMB. So you have this quantity V and... Uh, what, uh, sorry. One, one thing, one, sorry. Oh, sure, go okay. ahead. Uh, so in, uh, like when we start, the field is only time dependent. But when we do the partitions, yeah then this space and time, both the thing will appear. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So we, in fact, we, we divide things into, so a priori, everything is both uh, space dependent and time dependent. And then what we write is that any field, like for instance, phi is given by a background value, so a mean value, which just depends on time. All there is space dependent plus a small piece delta phi, a fluctuation, which will depend on space and, and on time as well, of course. It depends on both. Um, and we do perturbation theory with this small quantity delta phi and delta g mu. And next thing, uh, hopefully you will mention, because there is a like, uh, when we do the quantum field theory in flat space, we usually do for a yeah. unique vacuum, which is yeah. the Minkowski vacuum. That's right. But in curved space, we have a different choices of vacuum. So why we always do uh, with this Barnes Davis? Well, yeah. So yeah. So indeed. So we start, So what we do is we we take this v quantity. We make it a quantum operator. So we we make it a quantum operator, and we quantize this. Um, which, by the way, just before addressing your question, just a small comment is something which is already not so trivial because remember that V contains fluctuations of the metric. So we are actually quantizing something which relates to the metric. Of course, we don't quantize the metric itself. That would be doing quantum gravity, which we do not do we, because we separate the background from the fluctuations. But this is something which really contains, I mean, which, which is consistent with GR and which, which really contains all the degrees of freedom. So now regarding this punch Davis vacuum choice, um, so indeed, the, 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 I mean, the crucial point is that if you go in the infinite past, because you're effectively on a flat background, so the, the geometry is the one on Minkowski space-time, then there is a, say a natural prescription for the initial state, which is the vacuum state on Minkowski. And this state, we call it the bunch davis vacuum. Okay? Then it will evolve. So but you were say, saying that the asymptotically it goes to the Minkowski one. That's right, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's correct. But of course, it's not, I mean, it's not a unique choice in the sense that, uh, 
one could say that yes, but um, I want to start with a different initial state, and that would be completely fine. I mean, there is no so the bunch Davis vacuum state has a certain number of interesting properties, yeah. um, because it is basically because it's the, it's the vacuum state of Minkowski, which makes it. I mean, maybe not a natural, but uh, yeah, a natural or a preferred uh, choice. Um, no, but there is no proof. Uh, Basha, the thing is, I theoretically understand, but is there is any constraint from observation or something like that? Yeah. So you, yeah, you can also view it in that way. So if you start out from the bunch Davis vacuum, then you are led to predictions that match the observations. And if you start out from a different vacuum state, then you get different predictions which are in conflict with observations. So in a sense, you could say, well, observations tell you that uh, the initial state is the bunch Davis one or something which is close, close enough to the bunch Davis one. Okay. Uh, but of course, but, but, but there is one caveat though, which is that here, I mean, when you look at, at observations, what you probe is a combination of your initial state, but also of the background evolution. So oh, yes. if you assume inflation, I think the correct statement would be if you assume that inflation took place, uh, then observations tell you that your initial state is close to bunch Davis. Uh, okay. yeah. But now you're free to assume something else and then you're led to a different conclusion. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what, so, okay. So, uh, yeah. So once you have quantized your uh, V quantity, and starting out from this bunch Davis initial state, then you can compute its time evolution. And at the end of inflation, you can compute its, uh, its um, expected, um, I mean, its quantum expectation values. And here is a plot of what you obtain in terms of uh, predictions versus uh, data. So this is the two point function of, uh, of V, if you wish, so of the temperature fluctuation. And this is a, uh, what we call the multi-polar uh, decomposition. So it's, it is very similar to a Fourier decomposition. So the, the small values of L here corresponds to the large scales, the large values of L to the small scales, small distances. But because it is done on a sphere, it's not exactly a Fourier moment, it's something else which we call the multiple uh, moment L. The red line is the theoretical prediction for inflation and the blue points are the uh, data points uh, acquired by Planck. So you see that the agreement is absolutely Excellent, which is a which is a very nice confirmation of um, of the standard model of cosmology, which includes inflation. Uh, here on the right is uh, something very similar, but instead of showing the temperature two point correlation function, I show you the correlation function between the temperature and the polarization of the CMB photons. Um, e mode, and you see that the fit is is, is again very good. Um, but something I would like to stress is that the red line here is not, so of course, when you, when you um, plot the red line, you have some parameters to fit. There are six parameters to fit. Uh, these six parameters have already been fitted on the left panel. So here there is no choice left. I just plot the prediction for the TE correlation without fitting anything. And as you can see, it falls immediately right just on top of the, uh, of, of the data. And here is again the same thing for the e mode for the polarization polarization collation. Yes. So particularly this uh, uh, e e and t, what happens below thirty? Ah yes yes. So below thirty. Yeah indeed. So I'm not showing. Sorry, I'm not showing what happens below thirty. Yeah, the reason is uh, that it it becomes um, it becomes difficult. So the measurements uh, become difficult, um, and and the error bars on the polarization become become quite large okay. so it's i mean so you you do not have much information on those scales um okay. unfortunately um because the because the noise i mean the, yeah the, there is some noise um in the uh, in the polarization data which uh, which dominates at low l that you cannot get rid of uh, in, in these plots mm. um so this is for the CMB, um, and then later on, there's very small. So at, at the time that the CMB is emitted, the fluctuations are all very small at the, at the level of 10 to the minus five, but then they will grow under the action of gravity. So structures will start to fall, objects will start to collapse, and this will give rise to the large scale structure that we see in the universe. So galaxies, clusters of galaxies, uh, filaments, walls, voids, and so on. And these objects, they also, because they are just a, a, a picture of the same things, so the perturbations, but, but just taken at a different time, 
and it also provides some information about um, the physical mechanisms which took place during inflation. So this is somehow the uh, standard uh, scenario, the standard uh, story that everyone tells and everyone uses when doing cosmology. But what I would like to stress is that it is, a non, it is not a trivial assumption that people make uh, because it relies on using quantum mechanics on cosmological scales. And this is, the, and this is something which uh, raises at least two issues. The first one is we have tested quantum mechanics in the lab. So we know it works very well as a theory on small scales. Um, but um, I mean, is it really OK to, uh, in, to extrapolate it to the scales which define the largest thing that we can observe in the universe? This is, this is the first thing. And the second thing, which is something I will discuss at the end, if I have time, I, I don't know if, you will, if I will have time, but, I, but maybe I will, is that um, quantum mechanics has a number of uh, foundational um, aspects or discussions which are not solved. Um, uh, one, one of them is, is the so-called quantum measurement problem, which is the question of, um, according to the Copenhagen interpretation, when you perform a measurement in quantum mechanics, you collapse the wave function of your system towards the, uh, well, the state that you observe it to be uh, lying in. And this, and this quantum measurement thing, so we don't know exactly how it, how it happens, but if you apply it to the universe as a whole, it is somehow problematic, for instance, in principle, you require a clear separation between a system and an observer. If your wave function describes everything, so the entire universe, by definition, there is no system and observer because the observer is part of the system itself. So there are some issues like that. So it is something which is not so trivial. Um, and for that reason, we would like to test it, to test this idea. Um, so using quantum mechanics to describe cosmological scales is a strong statement. Um, and as we often say, extraordinary statement requires extraordinary evidence. So we would like to find some evidence for the, uh, the, the I mean, the rightfulness of using quantum mechanics at this level. Um, something which, of course, people always implicitly uh, think is that, well, if you, um, if you accept this idea of using quantum mechanics, and the consequences of this idea, which is the predictions of the uh, statistics of the CMB, for instance, uh, those consequences are very much consistent with observations. And I think implicitly, most of the time, people take that as an indication or even maybe almost as a proof that it is okay to use quantum mechanics to describe the universe as a whole. And in some sense, it is in, indeed a very good indication that we are doing something which is maybe, I mean, probably right, but it's not a direct proof, right? It's just a, it's an indirect proof, if you want. An indirect confirmation that cosmological structures have a quantum mechanical origin, but the question is, well, is there any direct evidence? Any, is there any direct way to prove the quantumness or the quantum nature of cosmological structures? So this is what I would like to discuss uh, today. There are many, I mean, there, are, there is now a, a vast uh, literature and number of people who have been working on this very interesting uh, uh, topic. Uh, here I'm just listing a few, uh, uh, I mean, a few of them. Um, I just would like to, just to underline uh, the role of uh, Renaud uh, Parentani, um, just because he, um, I mean, you may not know, but he very sadly uh, passed away a couple of, of months ago. Um, and he made very interesting and important contributions to that, to that topic. I know he was still very interested in that. So I just, uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention his work in particular and pay a tribute to, uh, to, to what he did in this field and, and in many other, other topics um, in cosmology and theoretical physics in general. Um, so in the following slides, I will mention mostly what I've done um, in collaboration with uh, uh, Jérôme Martin in, the, in this topic. Um, this will overlap and partly um, discuss things which have been addressed in, in, in these other papers by other people. But, um, but yeah, just, uh, just as a way to, to, to look uh, concrete. So let me re-say a little bit what I said before. Um, so we have a metric and we have a scale of field five which drives inflation. Um, what we do is we split this metric and the scale of field into a time, in the, I mean, a time dependent piece, which is space independent, which describes the background, and the small fluctuation part delta G nu nu and delta phi, which both depend on, on time and space. And then, as I said before, you can find a certain combination of this delta phi and delta G nu nu, 
which here I call zeta, before I called it v, but the two are, are just related by some function of time, so it's basically the same quantity. Um, and this fluctuation field directly determines the uh, anisotropy in the CMB temperature. Okay, so now the question I would like to ask is, according to inflation at least, what is the quantum state in which this uh, zeta fluctuation is placed? And what are the properties of this quantum state? So in order to, to study this quantum state, one has to find a Hamiltonian or Lagrangian, or I mean, the action for that system. And this is done in cosmology by taking the uh, uh, Einstein-Hilbert action. So you take an action which contains gravity and which contains your scalar field phi, and you expand it with some potential, and you expand it uh, at second order. So if you expand it at leading order, at first order, you just get your uh, the equations of motion for the background, for the background part, which is taken to be classical here. This is the GNU new bar and the phi bar. And if you expand it at second order, you get the uh, description of the fluctuations, okay? So now if you quantize your zeta quantity, you can quantize it in terms of creation and annihilation operators, uh, C and T dagger, and the Hamiltonian you get is the one which is on the screen, which is on my slide. So it is a second order, um, a second order Hamiltonian, you see it contains uh, products uh, C, C dagger, C, 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 and so on, just because I have expanded the action at second order, but this is the leading order. And there are mostly two terms in this action. So first you see there is an integral over K, so it's you integrate over all the Fourier modes in your spectrum. And then there are two terms. The first one is what we call the free term, which is a term you would get in any free theory, right? So if you have just a regular um, um, harmonic oscillator, with a frequency with a W, with your frequency, which is just K, then you would get this free term. Okay, so you see that there is a C, C dagger, so it either um, create and uh, annihilates a particle with moment, momentum K, or it creates and annihilates a particle with momentum minus K, so it does not do much. And then you have this second term, which is more interesting, which is an interacting term between the quantum fluctuations you see here described in terms of the C, K, C minus K. So this guy annihilates the particles with K and annihilates the particles with minus K. Or it creates the particles with K and creates the particles with minus K. So of course, only these terms are allowed because you need to preserve statistical isotropy. So whenever you create a particle with momentum K, you need to create a particle with momentum minus K. And this term here is controlled by a source which, which is sometimes called a pump field in the in the in, I mean in the in the in the community of uh, in the conventions of quantum optics, which is um, the pendling. So this guy depends on time. A is the scale factor. Remember, and epsilon one I've just defined it on the bottom right of the screen is is, uh, is something which also depends on the scale factor and the derivatives of the time derivative of the scale factor. So if your geometry is, uh, is um, constant, I mean, if, if the background is not expanding, so if A is a constant, this guy here, which is within the red circle, is, is zero, okay? So you don't have this interacting term. But as soon as you have an expanding background, remember you have a curved, uh, it means you have a curved space time, and this gives rise to this second term in the Hamiltonian, which will lead to this uh, particle creation mechanism. Okay, so, if you start out from the vacuum state, right? So what happens is at early time, remember, you can neglect the effect of the curvature of the expansion. So you can neglect the term within the green uh, box here. You only have the free term. Um, so you can define a vacuum state, which is just a state with, value, with zero particle. So you start from the state with zero particle, and then you let uh, the evolution proceed, thanks to this Hamiltonian, and you get the following quantum state. So what you obtain is, so if I just go back to the previous slide, you see that the Hamiltonian is just a sum, is written as a sum over k, which means that if you start out from a separable state uh, in terms of uh, wave numbers, it will remain separable. So you can write the, the wave function as a product of wave functions, each of them living in a different uh, uh, case uh, space, psi k, where psi k is given by this formula. So psi k is a sum of states which contain n particles in k and n particles in minus k. And again, this is, I mean, this is somehow expected because you want to preserve statistical isotropy. So that you should have the same number of particles with k and, and, and the particles with minus k. 
And in this sum, you have two numbers, um, rk and phi k, which are called the squeezing parameters for a reason that I will uh, explain in a minute. And this state is called a two-mode squeezed state. So I will explain the, the notion of squeezing in a minute. And, but something you can immediately realize is that these states are entangled states, right? There are some correlations between the modes k and the modes minus k. Um, so just before I move on to that, to this entanglement aspect. Vasa, yeah, sure. Yeah. This n and k eigenstate of which Hamiltonian that interacting Hamiltonian that you have written. Yes, yes, that's right. So it's the high, yeah, it's the eigenstates of the of the number of particle operators. Oh, and, then, okay. and the number of particle, sorry, I've been too far in my slide, sorry. If I just go back to the Hamiltonian, um, uh, you see it is written in terms of C and C dagger. This is the number of particle operator. Exactly, yeah. So you can define a, a number of particle operator, which would be C, C dagger. Yeah. And this is, yeah, and these are the eigenstates of this, uh, of this guy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So these, um, the two squeezing parameters, rk and phi k, they depend on time, right? Um, so for instance, if you plot rk as a function of time, what you get is the following. If you go very far in the past, so remember that you, you, you reach your initial state, which is the vacuum state. And in the vacuum state, r is initially zero. Um, so what it means is um, at, at, at this initial time, the only term which contributes in the sum, in the sum that I have written for psi, is the term with n equals zero, which means that the only state which exists is the state with zero particle. Okay, the sum is, is just basically psi equals the state with zero particle in k and zero particle in minus k. And then, so on the plot here, um, a equals a star, so a over a star equals one, corresponds to the time when uh, k, uh, I mean the, the wavelengths associated to k crosses out the Hubble radius. So it corresponds to the time when you start to feel the effect of the expansion of the background. And at this time, as you can see, uh, R starts to increase as a function of time. So what happens when it increases is, if you go back to, this, to the formula with the sum for psi, then you see that the different coefficients which control the amplitude of the terms containing more particles starts to increase as well, meaning that you start to, to have a contribution from the terms which contain one particle in k and one particle in minus k, two particles in k, two particles in minus k, so on and so forth. So what it means is you have a production of particles, right? If you, if you wanted to compute the expectation value of the number of particles, then you would get something which is not zero and it's in the state. So this is the, the quantum particle creation um, mechanism that I was referring to before. But this is uh, the particle creation, maybe many number of particle creation from one field. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. So it, um, all of what I said applies to every mode, every Fourier mode K independently. Yeah. Uh, but your entire field is made of an infinite collection of uh, Fourier modes. Yeah. So you have an infinite collection of uh, parametric oscillators, and each of them has an increasing number of quantum particles. Yeah, why I'm asking? Because the question I have asked you in email, uh, yeah, the uh, regarding the uh, having a squeeze state formalism for many uh, field. Yes, yes, that's right. So at the moment, yeah, indeed. So at the moment, I'm only considering a single field, a single scalar field. And because I'm working at leading at uh, quadratic order, so I mean leading order and perturbation theory, all the Fourier modes decouple, and I have this simple setup. But of course, if you consider uh, more fields, and if they interact, then you also, at, I mean, at, at linear order, you also reach a squeezed state. But this will not be a two-mode squeezed state, but it will be a four-mode or or a six-mode squeezed state, depending on the number of fields. And, and, and uh, so most of what I'm going to say will still hold, but there are, of course, some subtleties related to that. Yeah. Um, so these uh, squeezed states are um, very often discussed in the literature, in particular in the domain of quantum optics, uh, where people uh, work with them a lot. Um, but one subtlety here, I mean, one particular aspect here is that the amount of squeezing that you can reach is absolutely uh, huge compared to what is done in the lab. So the amount of squeezing is usually measured in terms of this parameter R, which is called squeezing amplitude. And from what I know in the lab using lasers and the most uh, recent uh, setups, 
people can reach values of R of the order of a few, okay? Two, three, four, something like that. Um, in the early universe, we get uh, values of R of the order of 50. So it is really, an ex I mean, it is an extremely, extremely squeezed uh, state and much more than uh, what anyone can achieve in the lab. Um, and in fact, it is also known that in the very, very large squeezing limit, so if you really take R to go to infinity, which of course is not strictly valid here, but just as a, as a, as a, just as, just as a thought for a minute, then the limit you get is the same thing as the uh, einstein podolsky rosen state. So you know the state where you have a spin particle, you take the plus, 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 minus, minus combination, which is the toy model that everyone um, um, discusses for entanglement then it is known that you reach that state. So this is a first indication that a priori, the quantum state in which uh, the CMB is placed is a, very, is a highly non-classical state in the sense that it is a very, entang it is a very much entangled uh, state, okay? So in what I'm going, so what I'm, the way that I've built this uh, presentation is trying to show you different arguments that, that, I've, that, have, that have been put forward either to claim that um, there is a huge amount of quantumness or that there is a huge amount of classicalness, okay? So I will put forward the different arguments and then I will, I will solve, I mean, I will explain how they can all be combined and, and, and what consistent picture we can have. But this, but this first description is an indication of going in the first direction, so in the direction of, well, there is something very quantum in the... Uh, in, oh, in this, uh, oh, Vasa? Yeah, like uh, when you were talking about that, your uh, like uh, during CMB you have a very non-classical non state. So, are you pointing towards the violation of Bell's inequality or something like? That? Yes, uh, yeah. So I will reach that. I will go to that. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Th yeah. This is, this uh, is one of my probably goals. Probably CHSH inequality or something like that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will. I will move on to that at some point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So if you wish, um, well, in fact, you, you have uh, read my thoughts or my slides. <laughs> um, if, if, if the question is, uh, well, is there a hope to violate Bell's inequalities with the CMB? This first discussion is an indication that yes, there is. Right? There, because we reach a huge level of entanglement, we, we get to a state which is close to the EPR state. Then indeed, it, 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 it seems very likely and very reasonable to try and find a violation of Bell's inequalities with the CMB. Okay, now there is another approach which, uh, which will take you to the opposite conclusion, which I now explain before, before so trying to solve everything. And this approach is uh, based on a description of the state in terms of something which is called the Wigner function. So the Wigner function is defined as a quantum system which is defined by a certain wave function psi, which depends on, on, on position. So Q and P here is just position and momentum. And, um, and you define this uh, funny transformation, which looks like a little bit of Fourier transformation. It's not exactly a Fourier transformation. It's something which is called a Weyl transformation. So you see you integrate Psi star of Q minus U over two times Psi of Q plus U over two, and you multiply this by exponential minus I P U, and you integrate over U. And you get in that way a function which is defined over phase space. So W is a function of Q and P. And this is just a, a way to describe your quantum state. So in quantum mechanics, we have many, many different ways, mathematical objects to describe the state. We can use the wave function psi. We can use the density matrix rho, which is just uh, an, op I mean, uh, an operator, which is psi times psi. Or you can use this Wigner function. And in fact, all of, this, all of these descriptions are equivalent in the sense that if you know psi, you can extract rho. If you know rho, you can extract w. If you know w, you can. So they are just equivalent ways of describing your, your system, your, your state. But this w has a number of interesting properties. And mainly it has two properties. The first one is, well, you can write down an evolution equation for w. So you can take w, you can um, derive it with respect to time because W contains Psi, when you do DW over DT, you will hit, your D over DT will hit a Psi, and D Psi over DT is just given by the Schrodinger equation, right? It's just a Hamiltonian applied on Psi. So when you do the math, what you find is, if your Hamiltonian H is quadratic, which is the case for us, then you find that DW over DT is nothing but uh, the Poisson bracket between W and H. And this equation, 
sorry, is a very well-known equation because it's called the Liouville equation. And what it means is the full, physically what it means is the following. So imagine that you take your, uh, so here is a plot of the Wigner function. So it's a function here I've replaced uh, V, sorry, Q by P. So the position is, is uh, because I'm alluding to the cosmological perturbation field, okay? So V is just my cosmological perturbation. P is the conjugated momentum. And W is the Wigner function at initial time. So you see it, so in the Budge Davis vacuum, if you wish. So you see that it is a positive function here, and it is a Gaussian function, which is which you can you you can prove. I mean, starting from this uh, quantum state, uh, you can show that uh, indeed, if you compute W, you find a Gaussian function, which is just a statement that at, at leading order at linear order uh, the state is Gaussian, and you get that function, and then you can evolve it with respect to time, and I hope the animation goes smoothly uh, through Zoom, but you should be seeing that the Wigner function is uh, rotating and gets squeezed in one direction and very spread in the other direction. So by the way, the fact that the Wigner function gets very squeezed is the justification for the name we gave to the state. We, we said it was a, a squeezed state. But Vasa, yeah. why this yeah. particular preferred direction? Ah, yeah, okay. So this I will, um, I will come back to this a little bit later. Okay, okay. <laughs> if you don't mind, but just, no, 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 just sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm asking too many questions. No, no, no. That, I mean, I, it's, it's much better <laughs> for me. It's much better because I have uh, some interactions, right? I'm not talking alone in my <laughs> in yeah. front of my computer, so it's it's much and better. Can you please a little bit explain that what this Wigner function physically explain? Yes. So we also, in fact, so I will also come to that. Um, uh, what I would like to do is explain this from the, yeah. uh, from the properties that it has. Okay. So let me just mention the two key properties that it has, and then I will, and then I think it will become obvious what, what physically it represents. Sure. Um, sure. So yeah, sorry if it's not, so yeah, maybe, okay, maybe I can just go through these two properties and then we can. Uh, no, 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 you, can, and, you yeah. can think according to your preference. No problem. And just make sure that everything is clear. Uh, okay, so now let's do something. Yeah, right. sure. Yeah, okay. okay. So now this particular aspect you are going, how the fluctuations evolve. Is it what we are trying to address now so that we are bringing, we are bringing in the uh, picture of this Wagner function, etc., and evolution of the equation for the Wagner function? It's, are we talking about the Evolution of the fluctuations are contained in the evolution of the Wagner function. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So uh, this is yeah. So it, it's just a different description. It's uh, indeed it is contained. If you take this Wigner function at some later time, for instance, at the time when it is shown here on the on my slide, then if you notice, you can uh, go back to the density matrix. Uh, so to the to the wave function psi, and then you have the quantum state of your fluctuation. So this plot here contains everything that you can possibly know or want to know about the the quantum state of your fluctuations. That's right. So okay. So re yeah. thank you. So regarding the evolution, let, let us now do something else. Uh, remember that at initial time I said the Wigner function was a positive function and a Gaussian function. So because it is a positive function, let us view this function for a minute as a distribution function. Okay, it is normalized to one by construction. So if you integrate W over V and P over the whole phase space, you find one. This is just, it, it's a feature, it's a property of the Wigner function. So you can interpret it as a distribution function. And let us just draw points in phase space in V and P. I just put points randomly according to that distribution function, okay? And now for each of these points, I will use the class, I will assume that everything is classical. So I will use my classical equations of motion um, to evolve this point, okay? So I say dv over d uh, time is, um, is just um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, commutate the Poisson bracket between the Hamiltonian and p and the same for p. And if I do that to evolve the location of each point, I get the following. I get something which is very much similar to the uh, previous animation. So um, the cloud of points is uh, rotating and then it gets squeezed in one direction and uh, highly uh, spread in the other direction. And in fact, sorry, let me just close that. 
And in fact, what this equation, the equation dw over dt is telling you is exactly that. So what it tells you is if I take my initial cloud of points and if I evolve it with the classical equations of motion, um, then I get a, a new cloud of points. And if I take this new cloud of points and if I reconstruct the distribution function that it uh, supports, then I exactly obtain the Wigner function at some later time. So this evolution equation for W means that W evolves with classical equations. It tells you that if you see W as a distribution function, then it must be a distribution function of things which evolve with the classical equations of motion, right? So it is a first, it is a first indication that there is something classical in the problem, if you wish, at least in terms of the evolution. Sure. Yeah, sorry, I, I thought, okay, I thought there was a, a question. Um, no, you proceed. Yeah. Um, and now, the, so, okay, now the second thing, so of course, at this stage, this is not enough to claim that W can be used as a distribution function. You just know that it evolves as a distribution function of classical things, but the question is, yes, but can I use W to compute anything of interest for my system? And in fact, it turns out that you can. So if you take a, a certain operator A, which uh, would be some observable of interest, for instance, uh, the temperature fluctuation of on the CMB or anything or anything else, then you can um, uh, apply um, a, a vial transform as well for A. And from the operator A, A hat, you can construct this A tilde, which is a function in phase space as well. So, so you see it's a function of position and momentum, which is built from a certain transformation, which, is, which looks like the one which defined the Wigner function. In fact, the Wigner function is nothing but the vial transform of the density of the um, density matrix. And then what you can show is that the expectation value of A, so expectation value of A hat, is always equal to the integral of your um, A function in phase space, so A, A tilde of Q and P times the Wigner function. And this is really, um, I mean, this equation is really telling you that you can see W as a distribution function. Okay, the reason is, it, you, so you have your W, it evolves as, as a classical, as a stochastic collection of classical processes. And then if you take it at, at some evolved time, if you just integrate your operator against W, then you get the expectation value of A. So for that reason, um, uh, W is often called a, a probability distribution or a quasi probability distribution. And is very often interpreted in that way. And in yeah. fact, yeah, sorry. No, you proceed. Yeah, and in fact, if you, if you, if you look back at the first uh, papers of John Bell in himself, um, there is a paper which is called EPR correlations and EPW distributions, where he say that for that particular reason, if W is positive, because of course, if W is not positive, then obviously you cannot see W as a distribution function, right? it has to be positive. But if W is positive, then you cannot violate Bell inequalities. So he gives this particular statement, which is Bell inequality violation requires a non-positive Wigner function. And from that point, your conclusion should be, well, um, I've just said that the Wigner function is always positive uh, for the two mode uh, squeezed state of inflation. Therefore, according to that, uh, there is no hope that we can violate Bell inequalities, okay? Um, but in fact, uh, in fact, there is. So now I, what I will try to explain is that um, the statement of John Bell, I mean, although he is of course, the, he of course made the most crucial contributions to this, to this issue, to this particular issue, but this, this very particular statement is in fact wrong. And it was resolved uh, rather recently, quite interestingly. Um, and, and there is, uh, and there is a way that you can violate the inequalities, even with a positive linear function. Um, so before, what time is it? It's okay. So before moving on to that, um, I would like to present, um, say, a third approach to describe the, uh, um, the issue of how quantum is the state of cosmological perturbations, which is based on a different, um, different approach, uh, which uses tools of quantum information theory. So since a decade or a couple of decades, there have been lots of developments in the field of quantum information theory, mostly due to the development of quantum cryptography, for instance. 
and and in this field people have defined uh, new tools and new ways to measure and to characterize the presence of quantum features in a, in a given system and one of these tools is called quantum discord and so i will explain what it is and i will and i will apply the program of quantum discord to this sort of two mode three states of uh, cosmological perturbations to show i mean to to discuss a bit more what we should expect so the uh, the idea behind quantum discord is the following if we can if we take a system and we split the system between two subsystems a and b so for instance Imagine that you have, I don't know, two, part, two particles with a spin, two electrons with a spin. Um, you have an electron one and an electron A and an electron B, and you describe the entire system in terms of uh, A and B. And the idea is that we would like to find a way to, to measure the mutual information or the amount of correlations that uh, there is between, between A and B. And we would like to find two ways to measure that two ways which would give the same result if, the, if everything was classical. So if there were only classical correlations between A and B, the result should be the same, but uh, maybe the result is different in quant for quantum systems. And so the idea is that, okay, you take these two ways, you, you compute what you should obtain. If you get the same thing, it means that you have only classical correlations, but if you get a different result, it means that there is something which is uh, deeply quantum in your system. So what are these two ways? So let's, let's start to describe things at the classical level. So at the classical level, let's say that uh, your subsystem A can be in a certain number of, conf of different configurations. So for instance, if it is, I don't know, uh, the position of an object, it can be at different places. And we label this, we call these configurations A, and we label these configurations by AI. Okay, so there is A1, A2, A3. And the same for the subsystem B, which can be in different configurations, which we call BJ. And um, so one tool that we uh, use uh, to measure information is uh, what is called the von Neumann entropy, uh, S of A, for instance, which is the amount of um, uh, information or lack of information contained in the state of A, which is the sum of the probability to observe the system A in the AI configuration times the log of this probability and we sum over all the configurations. So it is a measure of information in the sense that, um, for instance, if the system is entirely determined, so if you know for sure that A is in the configuration A3, for instance, that you have that P of A3 is one and the other ones are zero. So in this sum, you have the log of uh, one is zero, so you get, you get zero, okay? So the entropy of a system which is completely determined is vanishing, and otherwise it is a positive number. So S, S of A is just a measure of uh, how much you know or how little you know about the uh, configuration, I mean, about the state of A. And then the mutual information, which is uh, often defined in this way, is given by this quantity, which uh, I call I, which is the information in A plus the information in B minus the information which is contained in the entire system. So why is it a measure of mutual information or a measure of the correlations? Well, it's because, for instance, if A and B are not correlated, so if, if these two guys are completely independent, so if the probability to find A in a certain configuration is completely independent of the state of B, then the information contained in the whole system is the same as the sum of the information contained in A and the information contained in B, and this quantity I is, is vanishing. Let me just prove it uh, uh, more specifically, just to uh, play a bit uh, with, with these different quantities that will be useful for the following. So let us imagine that my system is not correlated. So here I use some short notations. Uh, for instance, the probability to find the system A in the configuration AI, I call it PI. PJ, the same as the probability to find the subsystem B in the configuration BJ. Um, P, I, and J is just the joint uh, probability to find subsystem A in A, I, subsystem B in B, J. And the P of I uh, bar J is the conditional probability to observe the subsystem A in the configuration A, I, if you know that the subsystem B is in the configuration B, J. Okay, so I use these notations, and with these notations, saying that my system is uncorrelated, 
is just saying that the joint uh, probability Pij is the product of Pi times Pj. So now I go back to my definition of the uh, uh, mutual information I, and I just replace uh, the von Neumann entropy by its definition as well. So it will be minus the sum of Pi log of Pi, minus the sum of Pj log of Pj, plus the sum of Pij log of Pij, and here I replace Pij by Pi times Pj. Okay, this is my assumption that the two, sips, two, sips, two systems are not correlated. And what I can do is uh, write that the log of pi pj is just log of pi plus log of pj. And it gives me two sums. Um, one of them is sum of pi pj log of pi, which I can uh, factorize uh, with the first sum. And the same for the second sum. So I have these two terms on the last, on the last line. And these two terms are zero because obviously sum of pj is, is one, because the, uh, my probability is to be normalized. And sum of pi is one as well, so one minus one is zero, and I get sorry, and I get zero. So this is just to prove that if my two sips, two subsystems are not correlated, then i is zero, and i is a measure of the amount of correlations. Okay, so now let us play around with i, but using a different, um, um, so moving away from the case of uh, uncorrelated systems. Now my two systems have some arbitrary amount of correlation, and I will just Again, play with the definition, but I will replace my joint uh, probability Pij by the, using the Bayes theorem. So I say that Pij is the probability to observe B in the configuration J times the probability to observe A, uh, A in the configuration I, knowing that B is in the configuration J. So I go back to my definition. I replied Pij by this, uh, you see, by, by this formula. And as before, I expand the log. So I say that the log of Pj, Pi knowing J is just the log of Pj plus log of Pij. And I take this, the term, the first term, I group, I, I bring it uh, together with my second sum. So I have the following thing. So my second term is vanishing for the same reason as before. The sum of Pi knowing J is one because my, because my probabilities must be normalized. So I have two terms. The first one is, you recognize is just the definition of the entropy containing A. And the last term, uh, I, um, I will interpret this as, a, as the entropy of A uh, knowing B. You see, so what it is, is the sum over Pj of the entropy containing A if I assume that my system B is in the configuration J. And I sum these entropies and I uh, uh, weigh them by, the, by Pj, by the probability to observe B in the configuration J. So I update this new formula, uh, which is that R mutual information is the entropy in A minus the entropy in A knowing B. And I call this uh, new expression uh, J. Okay, the two things are the same. Uh, so at the classical level, uh, I minus J is just zero. Um, so you see here, I've just, what I've done is just introduced two ways to, to define the, the, the mutual information. Either I take the information in A plus the information in B, I subtract the information of the overall system, or I take the information in A and then I subtract the information in A having measured B. Again, if the two, if the two systems are uncorrelated, whether or not I measure B doesn't change anything. So S of A and S of A knowing B is the same, and J is zero as well. So the two things measure the amount of, of correlation, but just using different formula. And the idea now is to give an equivalent of both I and J at the quantum mechanical level. So let's do that. So quantum mechanically, uh, well, the von Neumann entropy can be defined as just um, in a, just in the same way. So I define it as being minus the trace of uh, rho log rho, where rho is the uh, density matrix. Um, for S of A only, I do the same thing, but I look at the reduced density matrix. So I start from the full density matrix. I trace over B. I have a density matrix which only lives in the subsystem A and I take the entropy of that reduced density matrix. So I know, and of course, S, B, S of B follows an equip, um, a very similar definition. So I know how to compute S of A, I know to compute S of B, S of A and B. So I know how to compute I, my first definition of the uh, mutual information. 
But if I want to compute J, I need to define my, this conditional entropy. So remember from the previous slide, the conditional entropy S of A knowing B is the sum over J of the uh, probability to find my system in the, in the configuration J times the entropy containing A if I assume that I have uh, observed that configuration J. So in order to give a quantum mechanical equivalent of that formula, I need to describe at the quantum mechanical level what it means to observe B or to know that B is in a certain configuration. And in order to do that, I need to introduce a set of measurement operators uh, which characterize the state of B. So if I measure these, measure, these projectors, this uh, complete set of projectors, pi j, then I will know what is the state of, of B. So here it's, it's still a little bit abstract, but um, after that I will give an example, okay, a simple example where I do this thing and, and, and you will see how it works in practice. So if I observe that my system B is in the configuration J, in practice what I do is I take my density matrix and I project it uh, to the uh, uh, projector of pi j, so rho becomes rho times pi j. I just uh, divide by this pj number, which is such that uh, the, the state remains normalized, where pj is the probability to observe that particular outcome, so it's just a trace of rho times pj. And therefore, I can define the density matrix of A if I have observed the uh, uh, j configuration for B, which is just, I take my, you see my projected density matrix, rho pi j divided by pj, and I trace over b. And then if I want to know what is the uh, entropy of A having measured b, I take those different entropies and I sum them uh, weighing by the uh, probabilities to observe uh, b in the configuration j. Okay, so it is, it is, it is just a way to, to, to define a quantum mechanical equivalent of the conditional entropy. However, one subtlety here is that this conditional entropy depends on a choice of a complete set of projectors. Okay, I had to introduce these measurement operators pi j, but there is no unique way of doing that. If you want that, yeah. Oh, this pj can be thought, uh, thought like partition function also. Uh, partition function. So, the, the, yeah, so I mean, they should be taken as. Um, um, for instance, so yeah, I will give an example in a minute, but if you take first a spin particle, yeah. um, and if you want to measure the spin, so um, say that uh, you want to measure the spin along the direction Z, so you can have either, I mean, the two possible outcomes are plus one or minus one. So a complete set of uh, projectors would be to take uh, the spin in the direction Z and the spin in the direction minus Z, for instance. Mm -hmm. because, because you know that, uh, um, if you if you measure your system, you will be in either um, in either direction. Um, so in that in that case, that would be a complete set of uh, projectors. But of course, there is a choice here, which is you have cho chosen to uh, look at the spin in the direction z. If you choose a different direction, x, y, or something else, then you get a different set of projectors. So it's a, it, it's just a, a set of operators which completely characterize your your system. If it's a spin system, then it is enough. But if the system has all the degrees of freedom, like position or something else, then you need to introduce other operators as well. Your set of, oper your set of uh, complete, I mean, your set of projectors has to be enlarged. Okay. Um, so because of that, because there is a priori, some dependence on the set of projectors, we, what we do in practice is we minimize it. So you can show that uh, quantum mechanically, I is always larger than J. So i minus j is a positive quantity, but because we do not, so when you take a minus j, you can get either zero, which means that you, have, you only have classical correlation, or you can get something which is positive, but in order to make sure that we don't get something positive because we have chosen a silly uh, set of projectors, we minimize over all the possible sets of projectors. So if we find a non-zero value, it is really non-zero for any choice, any possible choice of projectors. And the result of this minimization procedure is called the quantum discord. Okay, this is how the quantum discord is defined. So the program is the following. You have a certain quantum system, which is in a certain quantum state. Um, you compute the quantum discord. 
If you find zero, it means that you can describe your subsystems A and B only in terms of classical correlations. But if you find something which is non-zero, then it means that you have uh, quantum correlations necessarily. So before applying this to uh, uh, cosmological perturbations, let me just show you a, m a more simple example. So um, uh, just yeah. one comment. Yeah, sure. So in a way from this discussion, so we can say that quantum discord is better measured than uh, von Neumann entropy. Than what, sorry? Better measure. A better measure than, than which other one? Uh, von Neumann entropy. Ah, von Neumann entropy. Um, that's right. So the, the Newman entropy is a measure of uh, the correlations. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All the, I mean, it's a measure of the amount of information. But, it, but, but if you, yeah. Um, but here it's a measure of the quantumness of these correlations. So, I mean, I can take two systems which are classically correlated. Um, but so they yeah. would, for instance, never violate Bell inequalities. Yes. Um, but because they are correlated, you will find a non zero. Um, you know, Van Neumann entropy. If you use the Van Neumann entropy, you will find non zero amount of correlation. Yeah. But this does not tell you that these correlations are quantum. Sure. Yeah. So here, so here is really the discord is really a measure of the quantumness of the correlations. Yeah. So it's a more generic, if you wish. So the Bell inequalities, for instance, they are an experimental. Um, uh, setup in which you can prove that there are some quantum correlations. So if you violate, in other words, if you violate Bell inequalities, you know that there are some quantum correlations. Um, the quantum discord is, is more generic in the sense that it will characterize um, correlations between any two subsystems without, uh, you know, referring to a specific Bell setup. On the other hand, it is because it is not an experiment, because it is not a proposal for an experiment, it is a theoretical thing. So, I mean, what you can do with that is take a certain state and compute the discord and then, you know, see whether there is or not some quantum correlations. But it's not a, there is no experiment which tells you how to measure quantum discord. It's, it's so more one a, more thing. Yeah. Like from a, for like, suppose you were studying a particular quantum system and if you found that uh, your Entanglement entropy, uh, uh, the behavior of entanglement entropy with time scale and the quantum discord with respect to the time scale, both are same almost. Then what is your conclusion in that case? Yeah, so entanglement. Yeah, so I am asking because <laughs> I have seen that if entanglement entropy is non zero and it is like be, if it has some feature with respect to time that will not come. Uh, completely changes in uh, this quantum discord story. Ah, yes, 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 okay, no, I know, I think I know what you're referring to. Uh, so there is indeed a theorem, which, uh, let me try to remember, is telling you that um, if I take two systems, yeah, I don't want to say something wrong, but I think the statement is, if I have two systems which interact through a third system, Okay. Um, right. And if I think there is uh, something like um, if I measure uh, the entanglement entropy between these two systems as a function of time, uh -huh. and if I find that it increases, uh -huh. then it means that um, the uh, the third system, so the so if A and B interact through C. And if the entanglement entropy between A and B increases, then I think it means that the discord of uh, how C is correlated with A and B is, has to be positive. So in other words, I think there is a lower bound. So the discord is a lower bound uh, of the uh, 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 rate of increase of the uh, entanglement entropy. And the reason why people discuss this property a lot is if you think of two systems which interact only gravitationally, so right. why I mentioned this particular story, because uh, there is an example which is called open quantum systems, yeah. where yeah. Uh, you are, whatever you said, exactly true. Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, but, in open quantum, yeah. but in open quantum systems, you do not, um, uh, I mean, yeah. 
a priori, you do, I mean, when you describe them in an in effective way, you do not really control what the environment is and um, and uh, and the leakage of uh, information uh, towards yeah. the environment, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but but there is indeed so, but, but there is a, a, a close connection between discord and uh, entanglement entropy. Mm. For pure systems, for pure quantum systems, the two are indeed, uh, um, I mean, equivalent in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the, the two concepts are, are closely related. Yeah. So, okay, so let me, yeah, just discuss a little bit this uh, easy example. Um, so here I take the a state which you recognize, I guess, because it's just the EPR state. So imagine that you have two spin particles and I put them in a state where either both of them has a minus spin or both of them has a, has a plus spin. And then I want to compute the discord of that state. So you know that this state is an entangled state, so you expect the, the discord to be non-zero, but which is indeed what I will find, but I just, just to il illustrate the calculation. So what I do from the wave function psi is I construct my density matrix uh, row, which you see has um, one over two over all, so it's just a two by two matrix, which has one over two uh, as the coefficient for uh, every entry. And just to make the problem a little bit more interesting, I will, you see the off, the off diagonal coefficients, so the two last coefficients, uh, I will uh, change them in, instead of being one over two, I just put them to be z over two. So I just imagine that I have some decoherence effect, which suppresses the off diagonal terms. And I also want to study the result in terms of the z parameter. So if z is one, this is just my EPR state. If z is smaller than one, this is just uh, a decohered uh, version of the EPR state. If z is zero, the state is completely decohered. Okay, now I need to choose my uh, projectors, my complete set of projectors. And uh, because it's just a spin system, the only thing I can measure is a spin. So, and the spin is just defined in terms of two angles, uh, theta and phi, uh, in, my, in my XYZ uh, space coordinates. So I have uh, pi one and, and, and pi two, which is just minus pi one. Uh, which which uh, form my complete set of projectors. And in fact, so this is the result that I get for the discord. Um, what you can show is that the discord um, is not dependent on phi, the, uh, the angle between x and y, it only depends on theta. So here I just display the result as a function of theta and also as a function of z. So if you take the EPR state, um, so the EPR state has z equals one, and if z equals one, it also happens, but it's not true in general, but it also happens that delta, as you can see, is always one, and it does not depend on theta. It does not depend on my choice of uh, projectors. Okay, it is just, it's, it's a very peculiar uh, property of the EPR state, it will not be true in general. And in that case, you find delta, which is uh, uh, one, which be vanishing and there's something really quantum with the EPR state, which again is something you expect to be true because EPR states are the, I mean, the, the key states um, to violate bed inequality, so this is all consistent. Now if you take a smaller value of z, so if you, if you imagine that your state has decohered a little, a little bit, then uh, the result depends on theta, so it depends on the choice of projectors. So you remember that you have to minimize it to get the discord, you have to minimize over theta. And you see that there is a valet here uh, which decreases as z decreases, which again goes in the expected direction. If you increase the amount of the coherence, you decrease the amount of um, quantumness. And if you really reach the stage where the state is entirely decohered, so if z gets to zero, then you have a minimum of the discord parameter when theta is also zero. And this minimum is precisely at delta equals zero, meaning that if the state is entirely decohered and the discord vanishes, because this, precisely because the state can be described in terms of classical correlations. Okay, so this because of course if my state is completely decohered, I just have a stochastic um, family of, of uh, configurations, so they are only classically correlated, and it makes sense that I find delta equals uh, zero here. Okay, so just a toy example. Now, what I would like to do is apply this discord calculation to, this, to the case of a two-mode uh, squeezed state, the one from cosmic inflation. 
So this can be done. Of course, I, here I skip all the technical details of the calculation because they are, I mean, they are interesting per se, but uh, they are not very illuminating for what I want to discuss. Um, because my state was only defined in terms of a squeezing amplitude r and a squeezing um, angle phi, the priori my results should depend only on r and phi. But as a matter of fact, when I do it, I find that the result only depends on r. Okay, so it does not depend on phi, and I obtain this expression here. So this is the quantum discord between the subsystem k and the subsystem minus k. Remember that my entanglement, my correlations, were between particles created with, with momentum k and with momentum minus k. So delta is, is um, if I do this uh, way of splitting my system. And it is an, a non-vanishing number. In fact, uh, r, because r is, um, is increasing during inflation, it, remember that it is of order 50 at the end of inflation, and you find that delta is of the order of 150. So it is a very, very uh, uh, discordant uh, state in that sense, which confirms that there is indeed a huge amount of uh, entanglement and there is a huge amount of quantum of quantumness in the correlations uh, for that uh, for that state. So, I mean, then the I mean the question um, it becomes uh, very uh, weird. Uh, is the CMB very classical, as I've just said, according to the positivity of the Wigner function and all the nice classical properties of the Wigner function? Or is it, on the other hand, a very quantum state based on the large value of its quantum discord? And in a sense, <laughs> I've put the sign to say you've reached the point of maximum confusion because I've, <laughs> I've argued two things which are completely, uh, which go in, 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 in opposite directions. And the reason why uh, there is in fact no contradiction is that, um, well, I, I've just I said it before, but in fact, uh, bed inequalities can be violated even if you have a positive Wigner function. And the reason is that there are some operators, a bit weird operators, but still perfectly legitimate operators, which we call improper operators. And these improper operators are such that the value transform, so the thing that you need to use to compute the expectation value with the Wigner function, takes values which are not in the eigenspectrum of the quantum operator A. So what it means is the following. Before I said, if W is positive, I can take this as a distribution function. And if I have some operator A, I just integrate the Weyl transform of A against W, I get the quantum expectation value, so everything looks like a stochastic distribution. But of course, this, for this to be true, so for this to be um, consistent with the classical realistic um, description of, of physics, then, of course, you need the Weyl transform of A to take values which are the same as the configurations in which you can find your system, right? So, for instance, if I have a spin particle, which can, a spin operator, which can take plus and minus one, the Weyl transform must take values plus and minus one. If the Weyl transform takes values minus, minus two and over four, uh, obviously, I cannot, there is no realistic connection I can make between my formula when I integrate against the Wigner function and the quantum expectation value. So, I mean, the formula remains correct at the mathematical level, but physically, there is no connection I can make, right? And um, people usually assume that uh, operators are proper in this sense, in the sense that the value transform takes values inside the eigenspectrum. But in fact, there is can no I need for this to be true. And there are some operators. Minute? Yeah, sure. Yeah. What you are calling improper operators, are you really meaning that these are not the self-adjoint operators quantum mechanically? Uh, no, so they can be self-adjoint. Um, they can be Hermitian in this. So yeah, they can be self-adjoint. So in that sense, they are really, um, they correspond to measurable quantities, right? But they yeah. are, in, yeah. Improper here just means that if I compute the Weyl transform, uh -huh. um, so I get a certain function in phase space, and then if I look at the values that this function takes, I, some of them will not be contained within the eigenspectrum of my quantum operator. You have a, can you give me one example, uh, a known example of this, so that I can appreciate this improper operator, properties of the improper. Any, any quantum system we know of, where such an operator we can define, they are Hermitian, self-urgent, etc. But still, uh, the 
transformation does not take value within the spectrum of the operator itself. Or you can, can you give me one example so that I can appreciate the definition of these improper operators. Yeah. So I will. Yeah. So yeah. So 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 thank you for that. So indeed. So in a, in a, in a minute I will give an example. So I will because of course the next step is. Um, if I want to violate bell inequalities, I need, according to that theorem, um, I need improper operators. So I will, so I will need to introduce one. I mean, uh, concretely. So I, I will do. That. I will give you one concrete example. Yeah. So so that theorem is is due to um, uh, Revson in 2006, and and really solves. Of, so of course he did that outside of the context of cosmology and and even outside the context of discussing the paper by Bell. But in fact, if you look at uh, things closely, you realize that this solves the, uh, the, the, the issue. Right? So the statement is, uh, yes, we can violate Bell inequalities with a positive Jinga function, but we need to use improper operators. So let's do that. So let's move on to, I'm just looking at the time. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah, it's perfect, you just go. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's try to, to violate Bell inequalities then. So here I've just put a standard cal a cartoon of the standard uh, situation in which people uh, usually discuss Bell inequalities. So the idea is the following. If you start from, so if at uh, a certain position, um, which is here labeled by zero on this plot, you send two correlate, two entangled, um, I don't know, electrons, for instance. Um, a and B, and if you measure their spins at two different locations, A and B, so at the same time you measure uh, the spin of A along a certain direction, UA, and you measure the spin of B along a certain direction, UB, um, and you take the product of the two results, so you get the first term that I have um, written in the, uh, in the formula um, at the top of the slide, so UA, SA times UB, SB. Then you repeat that but you change the direction of B, so you measure it along the direction UB prime, then you change the direction of, uh, for A, so you measure it along the direction UA prime, and then you change the direction of both. So you need to define four directions, the one of, U, the one of SA, the one of SB, the one of um, um, SA prime and SB prime. And, it, and so you, you construct this, uh, what is called the Bell operator, and you, and you compute its expectation value, then, what you find, so it, it, it's Bell theorem, what you find is that if the two systems A and B uh, only have classical correlation, so if you can describe everything in terms of a classical distribution function or, the, or classical probabilities, then the expectation value of B should be less than two. If you find it, if experimentally you find a result which is larger than two, then it means that you violate Bell inequalities, so you have the proof that your system has some quantum correlations. So you need three things in order to do that. The first thing you need is to have a bias. Yes. What is this particular form of B you have considered? Sorry, say it again. I have. No, I'm saying that why you have considered this particular structure of the B operator? Well, it is. Um, I mean, it, I. I don't think I've made uh, really an assumption here. It's the, um, it's the usual way that... Uh, yeah, I'm just asking that why people usually construct uh, in terms of B. Uh, I, why, I mean, why, why is that the relevant operator? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so they are a family, yeah. So, <laughs> the reason is it's the I mean the true reason is it's the one considered by Bell <laughs> historically and um, and as a matter of fact you can you can define um, um, more generic um, Bell in, Bell operators you can for instance you can measure spins um, um, well you can measure for, you can measure spins for uh, not uh, I mean with more than two subsystems or three subsystems four subsystems and you can combine them in different ways. As well, um, but at least this one is the is the simplest one. And um, okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. But you, but you can consider. I mean, there is a larger class of uh, inequalities which. So is that called CHSH inequality? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. This one is, is, is exactly. Yeah. 
So for that uh, program to be uh, followed, you need three things. The first one is you need a, a bipartite system, so a system with two subsystems, A and B. But for the CMB, because we have K and minus K, this is okay, we can just split our system in that way, look at uh, K and look at minus K. Then we need an entangled system, but as we have uh, said, uh, the two mode uh, squeezed state of inflation is both entangled and has a non-vanishing discord. So it's a very good candidate for violating these inequalities. However, the third ingredient, which is not trivial, is we need something which is an improper operator, according to the theorem I just stated one slide ago. And we also need something which is a spin-like operator, because this uh, Bell operator is made of uh, spin quantities. Okay, So something which is either plus one or minus one. So we need to build something which is an improper spin-like operator. And in fact, this can be done as follows. So um, the one subtlety here is, contrary to what happens usually when you discuss Bell inequalities, is we have a continuous variable. It's not a spin. A spin variable is a discrete variable. It can either be plus one or minus one. But if you measure the temperature on the CMB, the temperature is a continuous quantity, right? So you need to, you need to, to, to construct a spin, um, something which looks like a spin from a continuous observable. So for that, we first introduce what we call QK, which is just um, a sort of a position analog built from CK and CK dagger. So it's a Hermitian operator. So it's, if you wish, it's, it's related to the value of my temperature anisotropy, which I can measure because it's a Hermitian thing. So QK has a continuous spectrum because again, the temperature can, be, can take any continuous value. So what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to divide the real axis of this continuous spectrum into intervals of a certain width, which I call L. L here is just a parameter. For the moment, it's just a parameter. Yes. This operator you are defining only for positive k, right? For each one, yeah, exactly. For each uh, wave number k, yes. Yeah, but, but positive k, not Sorry? only for positive k. Uh, yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So indeed, so because uh, k and minus k are uh, part yeah. of the same uh, sort of system, I need yeah. to, exactly, I need to, I take half of my Fourier space. Okay. Yeah, and for, and for each k within this uh, half Fourier space, I, I, I can define this qk. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so I split my continuous spectrum into intervals of length uh, L, where L here is just a parameter that I choose to be whatever I want. Then I perform a measurement of qk, so of my temperature amplitude, it will fall into one of these intervals. I don't know which one. Here, I've just taken an example on the plot. And then I will return plus one or minus one, depending on which interval I fall into. Okay, so I get minus one to the power n, where n is just a label of the sub-interval in which uh, my measurement is falling. And of course, by construction, this is, uh, well, this is just a big, it can either return this one or this one, it looks like a spin. In fact, it, it, it is actually a spin in the sense that, so this has been proposed by Larson in 2004. So if you uh, write it down as an operator um, in terms of, uh, of kets and bras, you get this expression. It's uh, sum over n of minus one to the power n of integral of dqk uh, ket q times bra q. And you can show that it is a spin in the following sense. If you square it, then you find the identity, obviously. And in fact, you can do that it can be completed with uh, uh, two operators. So you see here, I define this S plus, which has exactly the same definition of SZ, except that uh, my last term, so the, the bra the Q is replaced by Q plus L. And then from that, I can define X, SX and SY, which is just a combination of S plus and S plus dagger. So SZ is a Hermitian operator, but S plus is not a Hermitian operator. However, you can see that by construction, Sx is Hermitian and Sy is also Hermitian. And then you can compute the uh, commutators between Xy, sorry, X, Sx, Sy, and Sz, and then you find that they exactly obey the SU2 algebra, the spin algebra. Okay, so commutator of Si times Sj is just 2i times uh, Sk. 
So you have, and for that reason, we call these operators uh, pseudo spin operators um, because they really behave like spins. Um, and, and you can show that they are improper operators in the sense that if you compute their value transform explicitly, um, so you see the, for instance, if you take SZ, so SZ, uh, the eigenvalues of SZ are, the, are just plus one and, and minus one because it's a spin operator. But if I, um, I don't think I've given the formula here, but if you compute the vial transform of that, then you find that it can also be zero. I mean, the vial transform can also, uh, one of the values that the vial transform can take is zero, which is outside the eigenspectrum, which means that it's a, it is an improper operator and there is the hope to violate Bell inequalities with that. So here is uh, what you obtain uh, from the uh, uh, two mode squeeze state of inflation. So here is a plot of, so let me, yeah, let me go through these two plots one by one. So on the left panel, you have the expectation value of the uh, Bell operator as a function of L, where L is just the size of the interval which defines my spin operators, which I can choose to be anything I want. It's just a choice of, of the uh, experimentalist. Um, these different curves, so you have different colors, they correspond to different values of my squeezing uh, parameters. So all of these curves have R equal three, but different values of the squeezing angle. And as you can see, um, some of them never violate Bell inequalities, like the brown one, the one with phi equals 0 0.04. This one is always less than two. But if you choose, uh, but if you decrease a little bit the uh, squeezing angle, uh, so you move on to the blue curve, the green curve, the red curve, and then the silent curve, then you have some values, some range of values for L, uh, for which uh, the expectation value of B is larger than two, and which means that you have some violation of the Bell inequality. On the right panel, you have a systematic exploration of parameter space. So what I did here is for any point in this plot, so I have some value of R, some value of phi, which are labeled on the axis. And then, so I have a, I have a plot like the one I have on the left-hand side. And then I optimize, so I, I, I choose the value of L, which leads to the maximum violation. Because L is something that I can choose freely. Um, it's really up to you to choose the value of L you want. So I just choose the value of L which leads to the maximum violation and I, and I put a color on the map which corresponds to the value of the uh, expectation value of the Bell operator uh, for that particular value of L which leads to the maximum violation. So you see that you have um, uh, two regions in this plot the dark blue region is the region where you never have violation of Bell inequalities. And, and those regions correspond to R, which is smaller than 1.1, roughly. But as soon as R is larger than 1.1, uh, you have this uh, region which becomes uh, blue, green, orange, and then so, dark. Uh, Vasa, yeah. uh, maximum violation, you want to mean 2 root 2. I mean, uh, yeah, so the maximum violation, you can never uh, go uh, larger than two square root of two. Yeah. But what I mean is, for instance, if you take the, uh, look at the left panel and uh, look at the red curve, mm -hmm. you see the maximum, what I mean is, so there is a value of L, which uh, you see for which the value of B is something like 2.4-ish, something like that, 2.3, 2.4. Okay. So for, so for that particular configuration, I, so for r equal three and phi equals 0.01, I okay. just, I tune L and I, and I take it to be the value where I have this, this local maximum, so 2.3 to Can I ask you a question? Sure. Oh, why does it depend on r? Whether you take r equal to three or 10 or 23, should it differ? Because should it differ actually anyway to calculate the expectation value of V? But why should the expectation value of the operator B should depend on R? I have a confusion. Yeah. Yeah. Why, 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 why was it necessary to choose it's an arbitrary choice instead of R equal to 3 or 10? I don't see that there should have been any difference in the expectation value of the operator or I'm missing something. Yes, yeah, so R is, uh, is a parameter which, uh, which sets the state, to the wave function if you wish. So when I compute the expectation value of B, I compute the expectation value on, on a certain wave function, right? It's psi, but B on psi. On a certain wave function, but the expectation value 
But if you are giving it, what my, my question is that suppose I would have chosen instead of R equal to 3, R equal to something else, how the characteristic of this curve would have changed? That's right. Ah, you mean why did I choose R equal 3 on the left panel? Yeah, I mean, you could ah. have chosen 10, let's say. I don't think the anything conclusion would have differed, right? That's correct. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, that's correct. So this, yeah, it's just an illustration. I, I just took R equal three because the plus. Basically, you get the R equal to three for your numerical cal numerical computation of this. That's right. Yes. But yes. Yes. Still, I believe that the property that we should get to know in this picture should not differ too much if I would have chosen a different R. That's correct. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's right. So in fact, this is this is the reason why uh, on the right panel I I, I scan um, a bunch of uh, values of R within zero and five. Just now, so I have something which, of course, I don't I don't show things for larger values of, of R, but um, but but I have a, a more systematic exploration of, of parameter space. Yeah, but why is that chosen? You have chosen phi equal to zero point three four exponential. What was the need for? Such yes. A of yeah, yeah, very good. So, so this line, uh, zero point thirty four exponential minus r, is the line which, um, when r becomes large, uh, yeah. gives you the the limit, um, the threshold, if you wish, where you violate uh, the inequality. So, if phi is smaller than this white dashed line, then you have a violation. So now this line is interesting. So how do I, so first of all, how do I obtain this formula? I just, um, so analytically, I just take the large R limit. So when R becomes very large, we can yeah. do an expansion. Um, you can do an expansion in R, analytical expansion. And then you can find an analytical expression for the expectation value of the Bell operator. Yeah. And, and, and you can see that, uh, um, so this is a function of phi in R, an explicit function, and you can, if you do the math, you can you can see that uh, the violation will occur when phi equals that value, and indeed it gives a good fit on the, on the map. It gives a good fit. On the, um, contrary, on the contrary, I'm more interested to see the limit r goes to zero. Okay, so that's basically in our configuration space yes. something like the origin. So it is choosing phi equal to zero point three four. What does it really physically mean? So if R goes to zero, uh, then it means that you're close to the vacuum state. Um, and so, and the discord becomes very small and there is no violation of bad inequalities. No, but still phi is non-zero, right? Still phi. Yeah, but if R goes to zero, the value of phi does not matter. Because the oh. state becomes, um, you see that my Wigner function becomes completely symmetric. It is invariant under rotation. Phi, if you wish, phi is the angle so R is the amount by which my Wigner function is squeezed, and phi is the angle which okay, labels. So it. I also becomes physically almost zero. Yes, yes, yes. If you wish, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm just okay. I'm just. I think I sh maybe I should move on a little bit um, at this stage, but I just uh, okay. So you don't so worry not, about the time scale. It is. I just say that. Um, Okay, okay, okay. Um, let me just say that uh, during inflation, rem remember that R becomes very large. It, it, it reaches values of order 50. And so at this stage, um, um, in fact, uh, what we obtain here is that we, got, we have a violation of the Bell inequalities if phi is sufficiently small. But in fact, if you look at the time evolution of phi during inflation, it, it precisely decreases as exponential minus R. Um, in such a way that you always get close or, or, in, or indeed a little bit uh, smaller than the white uh, line on this map. And the details of uh, whether you're above or below this line really depends on the details of, your, of the dynamics of inflation. So whether, I mean, the, the, the details of the values of NS, for instance, will, will um, determine the, the precise uh, location with respect to that line. So it is quite interesting to see that um, for that reason, some models will lead to a violation, some other models will not lead to, to the violation, but, but it really depends on the details, on the details of the sterile parameters and everything like that. But before, I mean, with that, I mean, there is no need to discuss this too much because in fact, uh, it, even, if, even if we are lucky enough to be in a situation where 
there is some violation. Uh, there are still some problems that we need to address. Um, one of them is, so I told you how we could uh, measure SD, but if we want to perform a, a, a Bell inequality experiment, we need to measure the, the two other spin operators, uh, Sx and, S, and Sy. So we need to measure S plus. And the problem is uh, S plus, um, you see, because, it com because it, it's a combination of uh, uh, the, the cat with QK and the bra with QK plus L, it requires to access some of the phase information. And this means that we need to access the conjugated momentum P. And the problem, or, uh, or which I call here pi. And the problem with that is, if you look back, look back at the shape of the Wigner function, the fact that it gets very squeezed is in fact um, um, means that there is um, a growing mode and a decaying mode. The growing mode is uh, along the position direction. The decaying mode is the momentum. So if you want to measure the momentum, you need to measure the, the decaying mode. And the decaying mode is, is by definition decaying, so it is extremely small. So in fact, when it comes to measuring the conjugated momentum, you're confronted with the uh, practical difficulty of measuring something which is exponentially small. So in practice, it is something which is very difficult to do. And in fact, um, so here the decaying mode is exponentially, exponentially suppressed. And in fact, it is something which can also be seen again at the level of the Wigner function and the Weyl transform by noticing that even if you take an operator which is improper, in the large squeezing limit, it will be not so different from um, uh, the operator. The Weyl transform will be not so different from the operator itself. So if you just take an example, here I, I take an example of something which is not an improper operator. This operator is proper, but it still uh, tells you uh, what is going on. Um, so I take something which is a quartic combination of V squared, P squared. So I take V, V dagger, P, 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 P dagger, plus the uh, conjugate permission. And then if I compute the value transform of that guy, I find that it is just O minus one over four. And the one over four here is just related to the commutator between V and P. If I had chosen a different combination, for instance, if I had chosen VP, V dagger plus the P dagger plus the Hermitian conjugate, I would have a different number. I would not have minus one over four, but maybe plus one over four or something like that. So the subtlety of uh, the non-vanishing commutators are contained within this one over four. But the point is, if I compute the expectation value of O, I find something which is exponentially large. It's exponential two times um, the number of e-folds spent outside the Hubble radius. So in a sense, if I wanted to reveal the quantum nature of the state, I would have to be able to pin down this one over four in the midst of this very large exponential uh, contribution, which in practice is very difficult to do because it amounts to measuring uh, something which is absolutely tiny. So it means that in practice it is, um, although, so the conclusion of that is, although in principle there is a violation of Bell inequalities by the two mode squeeze states, the one in which cosmological again. Is this the yeah. operator O tilde O? You are saying O tilde is the operator which you are defining as an improper operator? Yes, in that case it is a proper operator. Yeah, yeah. Because it has a con yeah, because it has continuous. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and I understand that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, so, so that would not be a good candidate for bad inequalities anyway. But just it's just a way to show that the information about the commutator is being hidden by the by the squeezing by the amount of squeezing. Okay, okay, I got it. Okay, thank yeah. you. So, just before I con just very briefly before I uh, I, I, I I conclude. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about how we can move on from that. Um, mm. So the question becomes, okay, in principle, we can violate bell inequalities. In practice, it is difficult because it would mean that we need to measure very small quantities related to the momentum. So the question becomes, well, can we detect quantum correlations um, if we only use position measurements? Okay, if we only um, measure the growing mode and not, and not the decay mode. Um, in fact, so there is a, 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 a simple remark that we can make, which is that if we only um, measure zeta k, so the growing mode, the curvature perturbation, um, the Weyl transform of zeta is just zeta. And so the Weyl transform of any function of zeta is just the same function of zeta. So any operator you can build from zeta is necessarily proper in that sense. So according to, to the theorem I was mentioning, 
it is clear that if you only measure the growing mode, you cannot and you can never um, violate bell inequalities. Uh, but the point is that there are other types of inequalities that uh, also reveal uh, the quantum nature of the state and which are a little bit different. So here I've just um, sort of uh, put them in on, this, on the same footing just to discuss the different uh, features. And, I will, and this will be my, my last slide. After that, I will, I will stop. So spatial bell inequalities consist in uh, measuring systems, um, so two subsystems at different locations and at the same time. So it does require a bipartite system. You need two subsystems. But uh, it does not involve single spin on measurements. You need to measure spin in different directions. Okay, this is the, the one that we have discussed so far. And the assumptions, the underlying assumptions that you test is realism and locality. Realism is the fact that you assume um, um, the system to be in a certain configuration. Um, you assume that these configurations, uh, they, they entirely determine the outcome of any measurement you can perform. So there is an actual state of the system, which is one of the configurations. And if you know entirely the state of the system, you know what the outcome of any measurement will be. So it is true at the classical level, which is, of course, not true at the quantum level. And then it also tests locality, because it assumes that um, if you perform a measurement on your subsystem A, it cannot impact the measurement on your subsystem B. Namely, it assumes that uh, the outcome of any measurement cannot depend on things which happen outside the past light curve. Okay? So when you, buy, when you test bell spatial bell inequalities, you test these two assumptions, realism and locality. So there, is, there, are some, there are other types of inequalities you can construct. One of them is called temporal bell inequalities. What you do in that case is you swap, you, you exchange the role played by space and time. So you have a single system, which uh, instead of measuring it at two different places, you, you, you measure it at two different times. Okay, so the assumptions you test are not the same. You still test realism, but locality is replaced by what we call non-invasiveness, which is the assumption that when you perform a measurement on a system, you do not change the state of the system. It's, it's exactly the same as locality. The first measurement does not impact on the second measurement. Again, it is something which can be true at the classical level, but which we know is violated at the quantum level, because we know that when, one, when someone measures something quantum mechanically, you project the wave function, so you do change the outcome of, of future measurements. So it tests different aspects of the, of the quantum theory. Um, it does not require a bipartite system, um, but still uh, it involves to measure different spins because you have to measure uh, spins along uh, different directions at different times. Okay, so it's not something that would uh, suit us, but it's, but it's just to highlight this other possibility. Then there is a third possibility which has been put forward a few years ago, which is called uh, legged guard inequality. And in this case, what you do is you take one system only, you measure it at different times, and you always measure the same uh, spin. Okay, so the spin in the same direction. However, what you do is you measuring it at two times, you measure it at more than two times. So you need at least three measurements, or four or five, and so on. Um, when you do that, you still test for realism and non-invasiveness. But the new thing is, you can, uh, you, you can use a single spin. Okay, it involves single spin measurements only. So this is an interesting property. And the, last, um, and the last possibility that I wanted to mention is what is called bipartite temporal bell inequality which is sort of a mix between all of these things. What you do is you have, you, now you have two subsystems, one and two. Um, but what you do is instead of measuring the spins in different directions, you measure the same spin, but you measure them at different times. And in fact, as soon as these times are still uh, spatially separated, you can still test for locality and realism but you just exchange the role played by the direction of spin. You just change that for the, for the time, the time at which you perform the measurement. So the nice aspect of that possibility is that you still, you still test for the same assumptions behind the bell inequality, so realism and locality, but you can use a single spin. 
And these uh, things, so the, the two last uh, proposals in this table, the leg and gark inequalities and the bipartite temporal bell inequalities, which both rely on a single spin, we have studied them in the context of the two-mode uh, squeezed state um, in these two papers. And in fact, what we find is that uh, in both cases, we have some violation. Okay, so the two-mode squeezed state of the CMB also violates uh, leg and gark inequalities and the bipartite temporal bell inequality, which is good because you, you can use uh, only uh, 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 measurements of the growing mode. However, there is, so there is still one caveat, which is that now we need to measure things at different times. And um, so far, uh, I mean, if you, if you only rely on the CMB, you only have measurements at a single time. So it means that in practice, what, what you need to do would be to take measurements of the CMB and to cross correlate these, those measurements with other probes like the large scale structure, so surveys of galaxies and other, other observables like that, and try in these correlations to build uh, legged dark inequalities or inequalities of that type. So it is something that uh, is completely, uh, I mean, an open question how we can do that. Do we have the uh, experimental uh, accuracy uh, which is required uh, to get to violations of these inequalities. It's something that I don't know yet. The last thing I, would, I wanted to mention is that in the case, so in the case of legged gark inequalities, everything is clear. In the case of the last inequality I wanted to, to discuss, the notion of locality has to be taken with a grain of salt because locality is usually thought uh, in the context of measuring two subsystems at two different physical locations in space. So my system one and two just correspond to different places. Um, here, because I measure correlations between K and minus K, in fact, locality is something different because locality means correlations between uh, two different uh, Fourier modes. So somehow it's not, you see, locality has to be taken in, in the sense of Fourier space, which is, not a, which is not the same thing, basically. So, so even, if I, uh, uh, if, even if I found a, a violation of the fourth uh, uh, temporal bell inequality, that would not necessarily mean a violation of locality in the classical sense. It would mean violation of locality in Fourier space, which is something maybe a little bit exotic and, and not directly uh, relevant. But at least for the legged gark inequality, that would clearly point to a violation of either realism or non-invasiveness, which are really at the core of uh, the quantum format. Okay, so I just, let me just uh, move on to my conclusion slide, just uh, skipping the rest, just to summarize what I've said. So what I've tried to highlight is that um, what we know uh, now from the early universe observations is that cosmological perturbations are placed in a very highly squeezed state. Uh, that this state has a very large quantum discord, which denotes the presence of large quantum correlations between particles created with opposite wave momenta. Um, for that reason, in principle, Bell experiments can be constructed uh, that would prove that the CMB um, uh, uh, is of quantum mechanical origin. However, in practice, those experiments would require to measure exponentially small quantities, um, which are related to the amplitude of the decaying mode, um, at least in the standard setup, in the sense that, of course, you can always find uh, more exotic scenarios in which the decaying mode is not decaying so much, or that information about the decaying mode can be contained in, inside other fields or other degrees of freedom, but you need to assume something a little bit exotic. Um, legged gark inequalities evade this issue. But of course, they require to measure perturbations at different times. So it means that this may be challenging um, also at the observational level. Um, finally, so something that I've not discussed, but I just uh, say it as a, just to, to conclude on that, is that um, there is also, one can also ask the question of, uh, is there a way to directly probe uh, the discord itself? And um, in fact, um, what one can show is that there are some indications that if you want to account for the, all the observations uh, that you perform on the CMB with a state with zero discord, so with a vanishing discord, then you find that those states have some amount of non-Gaussianity necessarily. In fact, it's something that you can prove. And therefore, maybe the current constraint that we have on non-Gaussianity are already enough to exclude a non-discordant explanation for the CMB. And that would be an indirect way 
to uh, prove that the discord is non-zero and therefore that there is some um, level of quantumness. Um, and finally, another uh, topic that I had in time to discuss is that um, cosmological observations are also competitive to test quantum mechanics itself. Namely, if you have a different uh, version of quantum mechanics or a different interpretation of quantum mechanics, in some cases, uh, observations made in the early universe can uh, distinguish between these alternative formulations. Okay, and for that, I, I just stopped because I'm already over time. No, no, it, it's perfect. And uh, like, I, I would ask all the participants to unmute yourself and ask questions. And just before that, give a clap for Vasa for giving such an excellent talk. And uh, now you can uh, ask questions. If I unmute myself, I will ask question. Yeah, please ask. I, okay. Uh, okay. <clears throat> you have told us everything. Now I would like to make a bold statement and I would like to get an answer from you, yes or no. Okay. We have tried to generalize various types of band equalities depending on our convenience to uh, explain something or the other. But my bold statement is that the moment observation is, we observe that there is even if small in 10 to the power minus 5, that we have this distribution of cold spot, hot spot, etc. These things, things. That's a clear cut indication that band equality is violated in the sky. Whichever we, we do, we try to explain it this way. For example, non Gaussianity, you made a statement. But we know that the way we started, with a single field, twin states, two states, single field will never give me non Gaussianity. But with single field inflation, we still find that observationally, we find that there is, even if a small in 10 to the power minus 5 order, there's a distribution, or it is not all smooth, it's not homogeneous everywhere. Yeah. So for me, that itself measures the quantum properties of the two-point correlators. And that already is saying me that Bell inequality in cosmological scale or in CMB is already violated. That's the conclusion I will draw from there. Okay, yeah. to satisfy Professor Bell, we might find generalized Bell equality, Gorg inequality, etc. But this itself already shows me that bell inequality is violated there. Will you say, will you agree with me or not? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, if I wanted to play the, uh, <laughs> the advocate of the devil. I know, I know I'm asking a very awkward question, but um, we are researchers and we are having a private discussion here. We are not publishing what our conclusion, whether you agree or with me, to get into controversy, but if bell inequality would not have been violated with our measurement of core two point correlation functions over the sky, I would never have seen hot spots. Hot spots. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I so I, I agree that um, uh, given the way that we understand the formation of. Uh, cosmological structures today, the, the very fact that we observe these fluctuations is Absolutely. somehow Absolutely. already a confirmation of yes. the fact that they emerge from. Yeah, I yes. think this I agree. Thank but you. I would say that uh, if I, you know, some people might say, yeah, but um, what if uh, the universe was prepared in, a, in an initial state where you have all these fluctuations around and nothing is quantum? Yeah, then I would have started not with a, if that is the question, my initial condition is that already this variation was there. I, my basic assumption that universe is isotropic and homogeneous will be questioned. Yeah, yeah, sure. I yeah. would start, we go to there. If that, if that is the case, they are asking the question, I would not have assumed my yeah, okay. basic universe to be there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then I agree, then I agree. Yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah. Then I agree.
But once we assume that, we, I, which I think we should assume, because I don't see suddenly in the Big Bang time, at the initial time, when it's a point which is expanding, why should the point distinguish about form factors in a point? Yeah. If something was happening in patch and patch, I don't know how to split a point into various patches to find out what was happening here and there. Yeah. And for me, that's a justifiable assumption. But once I assume it, that I observe this, it gives me a clear cut indication that the evolution of the inverse is a fully quantum mechanical and hence Bell violation has to take place. Yes, yes, no, with that I agree. Yeah. Thank you. There are other questions, please. Uh, I have one question. I'm sorry. Hello? Yeah, yeah, please ask. Yeah, yeah. First of all, thank you, uh, Professor, for your uh, nice, uh, nice presentation. Uh, 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 hello, hello, hello. We can't hear you properly. Can you speak a little bit? Some noise is coming. Okay, now it is all. Uh, it is all right. Or not? Yeah, yeah. Now it is better. Yeah. Okay, okay. Actually, I am from mathematics background. Uh, I am doing postdoc in harmonic analysis, IIT Indore. And I am working in web concept in micro local analysis. So I think there are important connection with the properties of wave net distribution and and the web concept. So basically, wave concept detects the position and direction of singularity of distribution. And some Fourier transform technique is used after localizing the distribution in time and frequency domain. And basically, the Fourier transform uh, it does not decay very fast. Then it means it it has a singularity. So from the picture of Wagner distribution, I think it has some directional feature or singularity. So can you evaluate the wave concept of Wagner distribution? So if it is established, then it will predict many good information about the Wagner distribution. It is, uh, just uh, I need uh, this suggestion. Yeah, so I'm afraid there was a bit of um, of, of noise on the line and I didn't <laughs> I didn't quite get everything. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't know, Sanyatan, did you hear more than... No, I also. So, uh, one thing you can do, that uh, uh, you can write to Basa directly. Yeah, yeah, please, please oh. feel free to send me an email and I'm happy to discuss, or maybe try to, yeah. Okay, sir, okay, sir. Okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the, maybe my connection is not excellent. No, no, my connection, yeah. it's problem here, from here also, I can't able to hear properly. Ah, okay, 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 well, yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. Any other question, please? Or comments? There are a lot of people. Yeah, no, I don't have any questions about. I want to make a personal uh, discussion with Vasa. I believe that you are student of student or collaborator of Jim Martin. That's what student, I said. Student. Okay, student. Yeah. He is a student. I, I am in India now in Niger, but I was for more than 20 years in uh, HRI in Allahabad in India. And Jerome visited us a couple of times. Yeah, that's right. I know. Yeah. With Ram Kumar, etc. So we know yeah. each other. And yeah. I'm happy that uh, um, you are thinking about these issues. Yes, uh, many people will not pay much attention to these issues we are addressing. No, no, he is actually working on these issues from longer time. No, no, I see that with Jim, the do that, yeah. papers, etc., which I had missed before I got into along with you about these issues. But somehow I was thinking from the beginning that I am a string theorist actually. And I started with brain in place on and blah, 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 blah. And then finally oh, got in. Vasa, Vasa, uh, sorry for the interruption. Vasa, you have actually cited our name, Panda. Shudhakar Panda, he is. Okay. Yes, yes, I know your papers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me go back to the slide where if I didn't. Uh, why is that going? Ah. Uh, yes. Here you, you have actually cited. Yeah, I, I, ah, sorry, I'm going too far, but I think, but can you see, can you see my slide if I just do that? Yeah, 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 I can. 
yeah i can see that this is the paper uh, okay yes, thank you very much <laughs> now now what i was trying to tell you that uh, i didn't uh, I, i didn't have cosmology as my background during my phd or earlier than that uh, i am a string theorist hardcore string theorist started with that and i got into brain inflation etc but i would like to sum up this idea as we test with the ordinary scalar field which we basically cook up to fit into our cosmology data but mm -hmm. if we have derived some fundamental theory like string theory a potential which is scalar field to see explicitly there what is the nature of this bell inequality violation when i tried with sainton with uh, axion type of scalar fields and we showed some results but i would like to go back to uh, brain inflation model actually uh, mm. that thing we derive from string theory a potential a scalar field theory we say that okay it is cosmologically viable it gives makes gives us the result what we want from w map or what etc but in such models uh, there are uh, things it is not a single you might be choosing a single field but mm. that field is still has some background interaction with various other fields which is a source of for us in, in when we are talking about a uh, violation of bell inequality etc suppose this field was not interacting with anything else mm -hmm. then we can test it and we can pinpoint that that's why that's why actually i uh, uh, actually few days ago i asked vasa about for multi field case how this kind of squeeze state formalisms yeah. can be generalized because then you can actually test for further thing like pens inequality and all uh -huh. uh, vasa also told me that it is a, a little bit uh, Yeah, you can answer, Vasa, because you know better. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was just saying that it's a nice coincidence that you asked me about that because uh, I think it's a topic which is not very much studied, and I just have uh, well, I have a PhD student getting started uh, in September uh, on that specific topic. So he did his master uh, internship over the summer on that specific aspect, and we started together to build uh, the squeezing formalism for. Uh, for two fields so for, for uh, four mode uh, squeezed states and um, and trying to see some some physical applications so I, but because this is a starting thing i, I mean if you are into i mean i'm very much interested in working with anyone interested in that so if this is something which you find well, i'll be i'll be happy once this covid problem is gone and uh, we can travel to each other's country i would like to have yeah. you in, in niger for some time to discuss this thing maybe santhan can join us also and yeah, that would be very nice uh, yeah you can tell me what is a convenient time you can travel at that time and uh, i will arrange with santhan yourself myself we sit down and discuss two things and see what we can do yeah yeah, yeah. and that, that would be that would be very nice yeah. and indeed i look forward for being able to travel again <laughs> yeah, i hope i will be able to personally meet you wherever it is in the world Ah, uh, probably. <laughs> I hope the uh, bell ring will be. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the nice talk. I really. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Vasa, I am extremely thankful to you for giving your time. Oh, thank you. Such a clear talk, and I'm uh, pretty sure that a lot of students, researchers. post docs even the faculties everyone will be benefited out of your talk because it is really an interesting topic and a lot of people don't know how to proceed on that um, i will upload it in youtube and i will sh share the link with you probably okay. you have the link i i don't know i have uh, what well, i have the link to the zoom meeting no and, no no so there is a youtube channel where i i don't know you are in the youtube channel of the, of the forum Yeah, yeah, forum. Yeah, forum. sure, sure. I have it. Yeah, so yeah. I will post there, but I will personally email you. And okay, tomorrow uh, morning when you are free, uh, 
you want to write an email to me or um, uh, yeah maybe let me just yeah let me just check a couple of things and, and maybe yeah I then, can write then you just men mention yeah. in, in my email i will be there okay 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 let's do that okay, okay. and thank you very much oh, thank and you. Uh, uh, yeah like hope we we can meet uh, soon if this covid problem yes and be safe and healthy with your kids and family and thank you. Uh, all of all of you not only vasa all of us have to be safe and yes. healthy okay see thank you, you tomorrow yeah thank you see you yeah bye everyone